ala Rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma 'allamtana wa 'allimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'ana bima 'allamtana wa zidna 'ilman. Uh, it is quite uh, another opportunity to be hosting one of our uh, favorite sheikhs. Uh, someone you asked you asked for you've been asking asking for uh, brother Zahran uh, a long time friend i used to beat you in gym right <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, you well, wish. <laughs> he had his strength i had mine but uh, he, that was just to let you know that he's uh, one of my favorites so uh, brother Zahran if you could please say salam to everyone who is watching yeah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh hope uh, everyone is well inshallah and they're using the days of ramadan wisely inshallah because we are coming to the end of ramadan now maybe one more week left just over a week and that's it ramadan will finish if you but, could raise uh, your voice a little bit uh, if you don't mind sorry yeah wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah um i hope everyone is well inshallah and uh, i hope everyone is spending the time wisely in this month of ramadan because Ramadan is coming to an end and uh, inshallah very soon you know we will be entering the month of Shawwal so we ask Allah SWT to accept our good deeds in this month well that is uh, our Sheikh our guest uh, Sheikh Zahran and today we are looking about family uh, something we've been taking lightly until COVID-19 really came in <laughs> yeah before COVID we had the luxury to stay away from home to stay away from our families but right now i think like a month or more we, we've been forced to be together and i think it is just about the right time for us to talk about this topic and sheikh zahran is uh is the man who is going to take us through that so sheikh uh, what do you have for us today okay bismillah rahman rahim inna alhamdulillah wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruh ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد قال الله عز وجل واعبدوا الله ولا تشركوا به شيئا وبالوالدين احسانا وبذي القربى واليتامى والمساكين والجار ذي القربى والجار الجنب والصاحب بالجنب وابن السبيل وما ملكت ايمانكم إن الله لا يحب من كان مختالا فخور وقال في سورة التحريم يا أيها الذين آمنوا قوا أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا وقودها الناس والحجارة عليها ملائكة غلاد شداد لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كلكم راء وكلكم مسؤول عن رأيته فالإمام راء وهو مسؤول عن رأيته والرجل راء على أهله وهو مسؤول عن رأيته والمرأة رائية على بيت زوجها وهي مسؤولة عن رأيتها والعبد راء على مال سيده وهو مسؤول عن رأيته ألا فكلكم راء وكلكم مسؤول عن رأيته وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مروا أولادكم بالصلاة وهم أبناء سبع سنين وضربوهم عليها وهم أبناء عشر سنين وفرقوا بينهم في المضاجع My dear respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى has given us a great blessing a blessing that we do not even realize that we are we have been given this blessing this is the blessing of Islam الحمد لله we are majority of us we have been born Muslim and those who entered Islam as well this is also a blessing for you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided you now when we look through the religion when we look through the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we realize and we can come come to that the way we deal with people and the way we deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this can be broke down into three categories the ulama have done ijtihad and they have broken these down it broken it down to three different categories number one al ibadat number two al muamalat and number three al akhlaq what is al ibadat ibadat is the acts of worship that we do for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for example the salah we pray 
the hajj we do, the fasting, the zakah, all this is ibadah. Mu'amalat, this is our dealings. How do we do transactions? How do we buy and sell if we own a shop? Are we charging extra? Are we, you know, telling lies when we are selling these items to the customers? Also, another way of dealing is how do we represent and how do we approach our families? How are our dealings with our families? Do we speak to them nicely? Are we good to them? Are we bad to them? So all these come under al-mu'amalat. And lastly is al-akhlaq. And akhlaq is the manners that a person holds. So his attitude or her attitude. For example, a person can be good, he can be bad, he can have patience, he can have no patience. So all these things uh, come under akhlaq. This is a person's manners. Today, inshallah, I want to specifically touch upon al-mu'amalat. That the dealings we have with people and more specifically the people that we meet on a daily basis so this could be yeah so this could be anyone from our family members who live in our houses with us this could be our neighbors this could be the relative the people that come into our houses the people we see on a day-to-day -day basis inshallah inshallah thank you very much for that uh, introduction brother zaharan I would uh, wish to inform you that we have a number of people who have already joined in Thank and you. if you have commented we have Zulaikha saying salam alaikum wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah uh, let me check in uh, someone is even I don't know Najib uh, is here and then we have Zulaikha we have Shafiq Yahweh this one uh, is a friend uh, one of the people who are really doing great da'wah in our country uh, Allah accept. They have um, uh, a media, okay, a media center that that, that really does a uh, great job to Shal disseminate the da'wah and spread the Islamic uh, message. And Brother Yahweh Shafiq, thanks for being here and say salam to everyone from the Thraya team. Uh, we have uh, uh, Sister Mona is here saying salam. So we have quite a number of people. That have joined in and a lot more uh, many more are going to be coming in inshallah uh, we, we could please uh, go ahead okay so um like i said today i want to speak about specifically how we deal with our uh, with the people that we see on a regular basis so starting off with um our immediate family so the people that we live with at home so this if you are a father you will be responsible for the children inshallah that are under your control if you are a mother you will also be responsible not just for the children but for the house secrets the things that your husband tells you you are responsible for those these types of things it's uh, very important that we have what we call behavior management in the house behavior management is how do we treat ourselves and how do we treat ourselves in front of our children how do our children treat themselves in front of us do we raise our voices in front of our kids? Do we swear and use bad language and foul language in front of our kids? Um, are children allowed to use these types of la the, the these types of bad languages in front of their parents? So this is all comes under behavior management and how a parent should be when they are managing their children and how they should manage themselves in front of their children and also in front of the guests if they have guests coming to the house. So it's very important that we highlight these part points for the parents especially and how they manage themselves in the house another thing is it's very important that we give our children and those who are living with us now i understand in some households it's not just one family you may have two three families living together depending on the size of the house and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says in the quran in surah al-tahreem ayah number six Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu Qoo anfusakum wa ahlikum nara Wa quuduha al-nasu wal-hijara Alayha malaikatun ghiladun shidad La ya'asun allaha ma amarahum Wa yaf'aluna ma yu'marun Subhanallah, this ayah is a very It's a very uh, It's an ayah that can, will wake someone up And when you look deeper into the ayah Through the tafsir You will understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Is trying to tell us over here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he starts off 
يا أيها الذين آمنوا قوا أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا. The all you who believe, أيها المؤمنون, all you who believe, protect yourself and your entire family from the fire. Now, what does this mean by protecting yourself and your family from the hellfire? This means we have to do our utmost best to guide our family towards Jannah and not towards Jahannam. Sufyan Thawri, Rahimahullah, he narrates from a Sahaba. He says, Ali radiallahu anhu says, قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِكُمْ نَارًا That the uh, part of this ayah, قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِكُمْ نَارًا It means, أَدِّبُوهُمْ وَعَلِّمُوهُمْ That install good manners into your family and teach them what is good. أَدِّبُوهُمْ Install good manners. So like I said before um, about, um, I said before about how we bring up our children how we should behave ourselves in front, how we should behave in front of our children and how our children should behave in front of their parents. So this all comes down to how well you installed those good manners into those children. Now if you, for example, use bad language in front of your children, Wallahi, in a few years your children will be using the same language in front of you and you will not be able to say anything to them because they will turn around and say, I heard you and mom say it. It's very simple. You will like kids are very smart these days. <laughs> not these days. All since the beginning of time, kids have always been smart. It's not that they just pick up because their brains are fresh. They'll just pick up anything that you give them. They're like a sponge. You know, a sponge when there is a wet surface and you put that mm-hmm. sponge on the wet surface. What does the sponge do? It soaks up all the water. Yeah, it absorbs all the water. This is what children are. Also. Um, also, another explanation to this ayah, Qū anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhu said, Yaqūl i'malū bi ta'ati Allah, wa attaqū ma'asī Allah, wa āmiru ahlikum bi dhikr, yunjīkum wallāhu minan nā. Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhu said, he said, do actions that Allah has made compulsory on you. So everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, do do them actions. Stay away from that which go against the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, order your family to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through dhikr. Through the remembrance of Allah, through the dhikr. How we constantly remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this will save all of you from the hellfire. Bidni ta'ala. A hadith is also mentioned. In Abu Dawood, and the Prophet ﷺ used this to expand the meaning of this ayah. He said, Muru awladakum bis salah. Order your children to pray salah. Wahum abna sab'isini. When they have reached the age of seven, wadribuhum alayha wahum abna ashrisini. And beat them, hit them. When they, are the, when they have reached the age of 10. Now what does it mean by hit them? It does not mean you take out a whip or a stick and you know you hit your children so badly that you leave a mark you, on them. You, you come to Africa, we shall show you how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, it does not mean you really, really hit your children. on the, It's haram to hit on the face, number one. And other parts of the body, you hit them in such a way that they do not, that you do not leave any mark on their body. This is the meaning of this hadith. When the Prophet said, وَضْرِبُوهُمْ This is what he meant. That when you hit them, you lightly, if that makes sense. Or like, mm. I know this is a pencil, but maybe if this was a miswak, you know, lightly with a miswak. Do not take out a big cane or a big stick and really, you know, hit them hard. Because remember, these are they're still children. Their bodies are weak. And our body, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, the, as, as we grow older, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts the power inside our body. So one fatal hit can completely either damage the child's life or it can completely take his life away as well. So we have to think about these things. So don't say, oh, the Prophet said, hit, so I'm going to hit. No. When he said hit, it means hit lightly. And then the Prophet said, He said, 
and separate their beds when they are the, when they have reached the age of ten. Now, this hadith it does not just talk about salah. It does not. I know in the hadith it says salah, but also we should do this for salah uh, for other acts of worship as well. We should try to encourage our children to fast in the month of Ramadan. Um, maybe some children are small. Maybe they are living in countries where the fast is very very long, and the ch- the child can't handle it. So in this situation, what we do is we try our best to encourage our children to fast as much as they possibly can. In the UK where I am from, the fasts are very long. Now what some parents do, they tell their child, okay, today you can start fasting. Now the fast, uh, let me just make this clear, it starts from around 3.30 in the morning, at night time. And it goes on all the way to 9.30 in the evening. It can go later as well, it depends what time of the year it is. Mm-hmm. So this is a very ex- extremely long fast. It's more than uh, 12, maybe 36 hours, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. If my mm-hmm. is, no, not 36 hours, sorry. Uh, um, that would be uh, 16, around 16. Or 16 hours, sorry, not 36. 16 hours. Now, this is an extremely long fast, and it's near impossible for a child of such a young age to keep such a long fast. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, what the parents do is that they encourage them. They say, okay, look, today you start fasting from Dohar. So from Dohar, from 12 o'clock, you fast till maybe 4 o'clock. And you have a little bit of water and then start again. So this is just encouraging your child and getting them ready. So when they have reached the age of puberty, when they have reached the age where fasting is compulsory on them, they are doing it willingly and they are ready and they want to challenge themselves to complete an entire fast. Yeah. And obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we expect uh, ajr, if we do anything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we expect ajr from him and inshallah Allah will reward us. Because everything that we have to do, we do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And moving on in the ayah, should we... moving on with the ayah in Surah Al-Tahreem, we, we've explained, Ya ayyuhal ladina amunu, ku anfusakum wa anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. We finished that part of the ayah. Moving on, Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is describing hellfire. Uh, he says, The fuel of the hellfire, it is anas wal hijar. People and stones. What does it mean by stones? It means the idols that the people of the mushrikeen used to worship. This is the fuel of the hellfire. People and the stones and the idols that the mushrikeen used to worship. Carrying on. I, I, I think uh, before you, you even uh, go any further, I'm sorry to cut you short. Yes. What I understand from uh, the fact that it's people and the stones, and, and by stone mm-hmm. you're saying it's, it's the idols the mushrikeen used to, to worship. worship. I understand that one of the first things a Muslim family should do and uh, should eagerly protect is is the aqidah of the of the of the of the kids of the children, because here we're seeing that Allah is going to put even the idols, those stones. So you can just yes. imagine we should be very strict on what on what our children and what what our people in in, in our people at home believe. Quite quite important. This is where saving them from hellfire starts it begins here yes. so you start with the aqidah the tawheed make sure that they have the right beliefs make sure that you you, you check in with them especially now that we are in ramadan and we are uh, covid 19 we, we quarantined uh, through the conversations you can easily understand where they are not thinking right especially now that there are many films and movies uh, everywhere yeah. that carry false uh, aqidah, false ideologies, we need to be checking in. Uh, that is another thing we, we need to really take uh, serious. There is a comment before we proceed, Brother Zaharan. Uh, someone is, is, is thanking you, Brahan Omar, uh, is thanking you for the beneficial advice. And he's stressing the point that we need to be mindful of how we... Uh, uh, discipline our our children uh, because yeah. yeah not to lose the not to cause psychological uh, torture and also not to lose the connection because you need that connection as a parent to be able to uh, the connection is the access to the child's heart and mind yes. and everything you lose it you cannot do anything 
for that for that kid. So thank you very much, brother Brahan, for that contribution. Uh, okay. I don't know if you have a comment about that, but we could proceed. Yeah, mashallah, it's a very good point the brother made. Um, many, I don't know how it works in in Africa, but I'm guessing this happens nearly everywhere in the world. Ask um, me about Uganda, I'll tell you. Yeah, so like I'm pretty sure there are children who do things behind their parents' back. There are children who sell drugs behind their parents' back. There are children who say to their parents, we're going to the masjid, but obviously they do not go to the masjid and they do other things. Now, this happens everywhere in the world. It's nothing like, you know, it just happens in the UK or America. No, it happens everywhere. It's a it's a global problem, this. And this mainly comes down to the way parents have treated their children. Now, if you are good with your child and you allow your child to come to you and ask you questions, then Allah, then that child will always come back to you. If they have a problem, financial problem, if they have a problem in school, if they have any type of problem, they will come to you and they will uh, find comfort in you. But if you're the type of parent that says, you know, go to your own way, you, you should grow up, this, then your child is never going to do anything for you. He's never going to listen to you. Rather, he will just know how to rebel. Rebel means that he will know how to um, disobey you and um, and go against what you say. So it's very important, uh, Jazakallah, for pointing that out. Uh, brother Burhan, yeah, be a friend to your children. It does so. Moving on with the ayah in Surah Tahrim, um, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Then He carries on describing Jahannam. He says, "Alayha malaikatun ghiladun shidad la yasun Allah ma amarahum wa yafalun ma yumarun." Now, Subhanallah, this is a very powerful, very very powerful uh, ayah in the Quran. Because we think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghafoor or rahim He is very, very merciful. But we never for a second stop and think how bad and how severe is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment. How bad can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually punish us? Now, let me give you an example. If there is someone in jail and this person has committed uh, a crime which makes him uh, liable to the death penalty now this person is going to die uh, because of the crime he committed the people who are around him in the prison the guard, the prison guards and the warden and the, maybe some of the inmates they will sometimes feel a bit of rahma towards this person but you know what, khalas, he's done what he did he did a bad act but now he's going to die so what they have there is they have a bit of rahma in their heart for this person they start telling okay what do you want for your last meal? Uh, what can we do to help you? You know, they, they'll even bring in uh, the, a, a priest to help this person, you know, gain closeness to God. This is what they believe in. Um, so the, the creation has a bit of mercy for this individual, regardless of what he did. It's just something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts in our hearts. But let me tell you about the angels that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put at the gates of Jahannam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described these angels. He says, Alayha malaikatun ghiladun shidad la ya'soon Allah. That standing at the gates of hellfire are angels who are harsh and severe. La ya'soon Allah ma amarahum. They do not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa yaf'aluna ma yu'marun. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them to do, they do it. There is no thing as but this, you know, they do it. That's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created these angels. Ikrima radiallahu anhu in Tafsir ibn Kathir, he describes these angels. He says, إِذَا وَصَلَ أَوَّلْ أَهْلُ النَّارِ إِلَى النَّارِ وَجَدُوا عَلَى بَابْ أَرْبَعَمِيَةِ أَلْفْ مِنْ خَزَنَةِ جَهَنَّمِ That when the first person who is going to enter hellfire approaches hellfire he will find there four four hundred thousand of the gatekeepers of jahannam their faces are darkened so they look very they look very scary and their can their teeth their canines are like fangs like very big teeth like how we see sometimes in some cartoons how they describe some lions and tigers who came before us very big canines so this is how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created these angels the next part is very scary qad naza allahu min qulubihim ar-rahma 
ليس في قلب واحد منهم مثقال ذرة من الرحمة سبحان الله This is a very, very important thing that we need to understand. Who these angels are that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed at the gates of Jahannam. Ikrimah radiyallahu anhu says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he created these angels, he took out mercy from their heart. So they have no mercy, no compassion in their hearts. They do not have an ounce, a little particle of mercy inside their hearts. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created them. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, take this individual to the hellfire, they do not care. If he's an old man, old woman, boy, girl, young man, young woman, they do not care. They will get that person and they will drag him to the hellfire. This is something we need to understand. There is no pleading with these angels. We cannot get onto our knees and say, give me one more chance. No, they do not listen to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created them like this. And if you think that, you know, I can muscle my way out of these angels, let me just tell you how big these angels are. Ikrimah radiallahu anhu, he says, لَوْ طَيَّرَ الطِّيرِ مِنْ مَنْكَبْ أَحَدِهِمْ لَطَارَ شَهْرَيْنِ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَبْلُغَ مَنْكَبِهِ الْأَخْرِ He says that if a bird was to fly from one shoulder of these angels to the other shoulder, it will take that bird two months. It will take the bird two months to reach the other shoulder. So you can imagine how big, scary, and ferocious and vicious these angels are. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لا يعسون Allah. They do not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever you are, if Allah says take this individual to the hellfire, they will not hesitate. It is very, very important that we understand this. Very important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described them in the Quran as Zabaniya. Qul a'yadu billahi minhum. Amin ya Rabbi. Should we carry on? Okay. Yeah, we, we, we should carry on. I don't know if there is, um, uh, someone is scared of the angels. The fact that they don't have any mercy. And yes, they don't have any. Yes. Uh, it has scared someone, but I'm hoping that you would really direct this feeling uh, to do positive about your dean, about your kids, yes. uh, because that is the point. You get scared, but not just get scared um, like like from dean. Some people make this mistake, Sheikh Zahar. I don't know if you, you, you've encountered such people uh, in your community in the UK. Some people, when they hear these uh, ayahs and, and, and hadith talking about hellfire and how Allah's punishments are severe, they just choose to run away. Hmm. Yeah, they behave like an ostrich which buries its head <laughs> underneath and everything. So some people think that when they leave Islam and maybe adopt another religion, they are safe. But, but these things we are talking about, the only thing that really will save you yes. is you uh, 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 becoming better every day as a Muslim, not running away. So whatever feeling you feel, whether it's love for Allah and his deen, whether it is uh, fear for Allah, it has to be drawing you closer to Allah wa ta'ala. So this is something I wanted to, to, to add. Uh, when yeah. Sharifa said, I feel scared. Let that emotion just draw you closer to Allah and not Close. away. Uh, from Allah wa ta'ala. Yeah. It's very important that we you know we understand this ayah because these are the things which are true. Now sometimes we sit and we hear many many stories about how people were in the past. But this is the day Yom al There is no there is no sh there is no doubt on the yeah, day it, of it, it does it doesn't matter what you believe. You know, I made I made a video, I'm sorry to cut issue, I made a video and, and I challenged everyone. It does not matter what you think, what you believe. These are facts that are being stated from the most true source. Yeah. Okay? These are Allah's words. It doesn't matter if you say there is no God, um, this and that. It is going to happen. You yeah. changing how you look at things does not mean that the truth and the facts are going to change. The truth of the matter is we are going to meet Allah and we need to prepare for that. It's true. Whether it be today, tomorrow, 1,000 years from now, but we are going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one day. And we cannot hide away from this, Ashraf. 
It's impossible. Like, I'll give you an example. Right now, what happened? Every single year, at the end of a school year, what happens? Exams. But, but this year, we got away from the exams. Because of the virus. We got away. There was no exams. But however, this is, not, this is an exam you will not get away from. Yeah. This is an exam you will not run away from. And the result is only two results. There is no, there is no, third, op, there is no third result here. It's either Jannah or Jahannam. If you are good and you obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then inshallah Jannah is waiting for you. However, if you disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and went against every single one of his commands, then Jahannam, may Allah protect us all, is waiting for, for that individual. So mm -hmm. I want you to think about this. When Allah says protect your family, can you imagine, Shaykh? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said protect your family and yourself and your family. And in the same ayah, he describes the angels of hellfire. It's something we need to think about. The mm -hmm. importance of our family, how sacred this family bond is, and the importance of protecting them from the hellfire. It's a very, very important matter, and we cannot take this lightly. Mm -hmm. These angels, like I said, sorry, no. these angels do not listen to our excuses. They do not care for who is old, who is young. They just listen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the main thing is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can all agree on. I don't think there is a single person on this planet, a single Muslim on this planet who will say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not fair. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fair. He is the best of judges. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the angels to throw an individual to the hellfire, that means this person deserved the hellfire. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I this person it. deserves the hellfire. If the same way when Allah says put this person into Jannah, the person deserves Jannah. So when Allah says put this individual into the hellfire, then obviously the person, he deserves the hellfire. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and maybe something else we could extract from this ayah. You realize that Allah tells you to, to protect your family right now. Yeah. And, 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 and he, he mentions how strong the angels are. So it means that at the law of judgment, we shall all be vulnerable. But you actually, right be. now, when you're still living, you have a chance because you're stronger. It's not yet time. You have the strength to protect, but you will not be able to protect them. Remember, right now, you have to have the courage and the wisdom to understand that you have to protect them from something that has not yet happened. So some of us would love on the day of judgment to start protecting our kid, to start protecting our family then. But now Allah is telling you that you stand no chance there. Yes. First of all, the, the hellfire, we have described it, and the angels we've described them. They are not there to listen. They are executors. They are, they are not here to, to, to kind of uh, be bribed. Or, there is no corruption on the day of judgment. And as you mentioned about exams, I was here thinking of an exam whose time and circumstances have been determined by the all-knowing, Allah wa ta'ala. So there is nothing like a surprise. There is no pandemic. There is no anything that will, 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 will get uh, the whole process. Uh, like, like uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking about a situation where we all have to adhere and there is no room for mistakes except for what you did uh, on earth. So you have the chance. To protect your family now because now there is still a chance you can just find a way of, I mean, of, of nurturing them but you do not you should not expect to do anything on the door of judgment allah has already blocked that door and he has told you so there is there is nothing there all yes. you have is now and i'd like to also add on that point that you said Sheikh Ashraf. um when we when we, you said you have to protect your family in this world, it's very important because in the Akhirah, we're going to be running away from our families and friends. Yeah. This is an ayah that Allah SWT says a person will run away from his brothers, from his sisters, from his parents. This is the day of Qiyamah. So there is no one who's going to come to your aid on this day. So it's very important that we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before we return to Him. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. Um,
I, I can't see any any contributions from the the audience, but uh, we'll carry on. Sure. We'll carry on. Yeah. Okay, so moving on. Now I want to speak about the importance of our family ties. I am talking about how we should behave and interact with our brothers, with our sisters. This is our blood brothers and sisters mainly, and also our relatives. How should we be with our relatives? Mm-hmm. It comes in a hadith narrated by Abu Hurairah The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala created all the creatures. And when he finished the task of his creation, the rahim, the rahim is the womb of the mother, where the baby is, where the baby stays for nine months. This is called the rahim. The rahim stood up, <coughs> and he said, "O oh Allah, at this place, as in the place of the creation, I seek refuge with you against anyone who severs my ties." Allah says, "Then I, Allah, then I responds to the, to the rahim. He says." I will treat with kindness anyone who treats you with kindness. And I will sever ties with those people who sever ties with you. The Rahim at that moment said, I am satisfied. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, then this is yours. What does this hadith mean? It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he was creating everything, the Rahim, it stood up. The Rahim is the mother's womb. And the Rahim said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, give me, give me something, basically. And this is what Allah gave him. He said, uh, the Rahim asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something. And this, and the Rahim, he, he placed his uh, thought forward. He said, oh Allah, whoever breaks my ties, I seek refuge in you. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I will treat with kindness whoever treats their brothers and sisters with kindness. And I will break my ties with that person who breaks their ties with their brothers and sisters. So we all have problems in the house, outside the house, relatives. We always have problems. It's not, it's nothing new. But we should and we must always turn back and ask them for for, for their forgiveness. Sometimes we are in the wrong. Sometimes they are in the wrong. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, you have to forgive. You cannot break your ties. I cannot break the ties with my brothers and sisters. Neither can Shaykh Ashraf break the ties with his brothers and sisters. None of us can break the ties that we have with our brothers and sisters. And this is, I'm talking about the blood relationship. About our brothers and sisters in Islam, inshallah, I will come to that point later on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet then mentioned in the same hadith, he recited the ayahs of the Quran. So would you perhaps, if you turned away, cause corruption on the earth? فَهَلْ عَسَيْتُمْ إِن تَوَلَّيْتُمْ أَن تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ so would you perhaps if you turned away and caused corruption on the earth and severed ties with your relationships those people who cause corruption and severed ties Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has cursed them he has made them deaf and he has made he has blinded their vision this is ayah in Surah uh, Muhammad and this hadith inshallah can be found in Bukhari and Muslim. So we must protect ourselves from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we keep going over this. And one way we can protect ourselves is that we keep a good bond with the family members. That we keep it tight with our family members. Now this was about our this was about the people that are related to us. How about the Muslim brothers? How about for example me and Sheikh Ashraf? Now there is no family relationship here, but there is one relationship that me and Sheikh Ashraf have, and that is the Muslim brotherhood that we are under. I am a Muslim, Sheikh Ashraf is a Muslim, and along with every single one of our followers, we are all Muslims in Islam. We are all Muslims, and that makes us brothers and sisters in Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said, It is not permissible for a man or a woman to forsake his Muslim brother or sister for more than three days. You have a problem with your Muslim brother and sister. The Prophet ﷺ is telling you you have three days. If you want to cry, you want to whine, you want to do whatever you want to do, you've got three days to do it. On the third day, after the third day, you go back and you be kind and you be back to normal. You ask for forgiveness. You cannot ignore your Muslim brother and sister for more than three days. 
And this is something that we need to understand that the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not based upon our emotions. It's not because, oh, you know, he did this to me, she did this to me. No. Whatever they did, you've got three days. Just three days. And you have to fix that. You have to fix that problem. And who is the better one of these two people? So if you have two, if you have two people fighting, the Prophet said, the better one of them is the one who gives salam first. That's why it's very important. The Prophet said, Afshu salam spread salam amongst yourselves. Salam is peace. So you're spreading peace amongst yourselves. Mm-hmm. So it's very important that we understand this hadith that we cannot go for more than three days without speaking to our Muslim brothers or sisters. So this, this hadith, obviously, it applies to all the Muslims in general. Applies to every single Muslim. In general, also our uh, neighbors. Sorry, yeah. I don't know if uh, uh, our followers understand how uh, toxic uh, keeping angry is. <laughs> yeah, I mean it is very toxic, even uh, physiologically. It is very, very toxic because it is. It is that is one way someone keeps a lot of cortisol, and cortisol we all know that it leads to cholesterol, and 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 and, and it is very unhealthy definitely so the prophet is actually do it for yourself not to keep angry for more than three days and by that the prophet is telling you uh, by mentioning the maximum it means that you should try as much as you can to to not keep angry okay i have a class at um, i mean uh, regarding anger management i think uh, tomorrow i will be on some uh, venue some zoom class we shall be discussing anger management i think i will post a link here later on for people to join in. Sure. There, is, there is a comment from uh, Sister Zulaikha. She's like, I think part of what we should be doing, or it is part of protecting our families, we should try not to feed them uh, haram. And by, by haram, here she, she means the food we buy for them. You don't go yeah. out there and make zulm or steal something and then bring that money and feed your kids. It's going to be very hard. That is not protecting your family. So protecting your family from hellfire means protect them from haram, which may include, uh, actually includes making sure that your family feeds on halal. Feeds on halal, yes. Your halal, your halal income. 100%. It's true that. Sister Zulay Khadabas. So we should, like Sheikh Ashraf said, how bad anger can be. Once a person came to the Prophet ﷺ and, the Prophet ﷺ, and he asked the Prophet ﷺ, Prophet of Allah, advise me. The Prophet ﷺ said, La taghdab, do not get angry. The man said again, advise me. He said, La taghdab, do not get angry. The man said again, advise me. The Prophet ﷺ said, La taghdab, do not get angry. Three times the Prophet ﷺ said the same advice. So it goes to show the disadvantages that a person can have when he gets angry. Because when you are angry, your mind has become narrow. You cannot see mm-hmm. the bigger picture. Yeah, that, that, that's the tunnel vision, I think. Yeah, you, tunnel you, vision. Yeah. That you just see the, 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 you just want to destroy or hurt the person in front of you. That's all you see. But you do not see the bigger picture. Maybe they have an explanation as to why they did something that caused you to be angry. And maybe you are wrong. It can happen. Misjudgment can happen. Uh, it happens a lot of times. Also, uh, moving on, the Prophet ﷺ, he advised us. So I, this I was this lecture was be mainly speaking about the people that we interact with. Um, so we spoke about the people that live in our houses. We spoke about how we should be with our relatives. We spoke about how we should be with the Muslim Ummah in general. Now moving on, the people that who are not maybe not related to us, but we see them probably more than our own relatives. And these are our neighbors who live around our house, next to us or around. What did the Prophet ﷺ say about the neighbors? He says, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu and Aisha radiallahu anha, they both reported to have said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Jibra'il alayhi salam, he came to me. He came to me and he kept talking and talking and talking to me about the neighbors. How we should treat them, treat them kindly, treat them fairly, 
do not cause them any problem. So the Prophet ﷺ says, Jibreel Islam, he kept on advising me about the neighbors. He says he advised me so much that eventually I thought that he was going to say, now when you die, include them in the inheritance. The inheritance, uh, the money that a person leaves behind, that should be distributed amongst his family members or her family members. The Prophet ﷺ thought that Jibreel Islam was going to say, okay, your family members, your neighbors are going to get a part from this health wealth as well. Mm -hmm. So it just goes to show the importance of the neighbors. This is just ha hadith to highlight the importance of our neighbors. You know, it's a very sad reality. And this happens in many households that when we make food, instead of making, instead of adding extra food, um, what do we do? We send whatever is left over. So we make the food, we eat the food. And if there is a few pieces of chicken left, we'll get down and send it to our neighbors. That's not the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. This is not the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you are making something, add extra water. If you are making a soup, or if you're making a curry, add extra water. And then give that extra to your neighbor. Don't do, don't eat how much you want to eat and then whatever is left over you give to your neighbor so are you trying to say that if there was nothing left over your neighbor wouldn't have eaten that day from your side if your family finished off all the food and there was nothing left then obviously your neighbor wouldn't have got anything mm -hmm. so it's very important that we look after our neighbors the prophet ﷺ said in another hadith report uh, 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 reported by bukhari and muslim Whoever believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the last day, he should not harm his neighbors. So if you believe in Allah and if you believe in the last day and whatever is in between, so Allah, his messengers, his books up until the last day, everything in between, he should not harm his neighbors. And he who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the last day should be good to his guest. And he who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the last day should speak good or remain silent. We always want to say something. We always have to have the last say. The Prophet is saying, if you have nothing good to say, stay quiet. Mm -hmm. Do not go just speaking, speaking. Don't, don't do this. Don't just speak. If you have nothing to say, the Prophet is saying, stay quiet. And it's very important that we learn how to control our tongue. Mm -hmm. The family can go on. You know, the Prophet is he's... He's mentioned many hadith and uh, also what is also included in the family is um, the in-laws. In-laws is basically if a person gets married, so his wife's parents or his wife's relatives. The Prophet ﷺ was good to his wife's relatives and friends as well. Khadija radiallahu anha after she passed away. And this was the first wife of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he loved her a lot. He When he was married to Khadija radiallahu anha, he never married anyone else uh, so Aisha radiallahu anha says that um, the Prophet ﷺ would sometimes praise Khadija radiallahu anha and she says I never felt jealous to any of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ other than Khadija radiallahu anha and I've never met her I've never met Khadija radiallahu anha he would say she is like this he, so he, he would praise Khadija radiallahu anha she is like this she is like this and then at the end he would say she is the mother of my children so Aisha radiallahu anha then says that whenever we slaughtered a sheep, Khadija radiallahu anha had some friends in Medina. The Prophet sallam would go and give that meat to the friends of Khadija radiallahu anha. Mm -hmm. And then Aisha radiallahu anha sometimes says, she says that sometimes I would say to the Prophet sallam that you treat her even though she's not present, even though she has passed away, you treat her as though there is no woman on the face of this earth. <laughs> this is the this is what the Prophet ﷺ has taught us about how we should be with our relatives. This is how we should treat our relatives, even if they passed away. And there are many narrations, obviously, that speak about. There, 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 are, there are many. Uh, sorry, there, there are many lessons we could extract from this hadith. We are yes. just trying to maintain our like. Uh, uh, teach about this particular topic but if we were to extract fawaid mm -hmm. we, we could go 
on and on and on because the prophet here is being uh, very genuine with with, with uh, himself with Khadija and with Aisha so uh, it, it it could be interpreted even more but we, we shall just observe time because we are 50 minutes already uh, down the road and um, uh, before Sheikh Zahran continues uh, there are several comments I think we need to address uh, someone was asking uh, when I when I talked about when I talked about protecting your family by feeding them halal, yeah. the question was, how about what should these children do when they grow up? Because they were fed haram and, 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 and now they are grown. How do they like cleanse their bodies and souls from this haram? That, that, that's her question. How would you go about it? Okay, so number one, you have to understand that when you are young, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has said that قلم, the thing, the angels who write deeds is lifted from a person who is young. So you are not held accountable for the things that you do. As for when you grow older, what do you do to clean yourself? There is no, there is no actual system where you can clean yourself or clean your body from the haram that you may or may have, may have eaten. So in this situation, you just ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you in the best of ways and you make sure that whatever you do, you do halal. It's as simple as that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to hold you accountable for the things you did when you were younger. Mm -hmm. uh, great. I don't know if you see that question. Uh, there is. Um, what should one right? do? Uh, what should someone do to a sister or a brother that doesn't want to keep on between us? I think there, there, there are these brothers who are very hard and sisters who are very hard to keep around. <laughs> like you try to, to invite them to a better relationship and do good with them, but they, 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 they just keep on hurting you. Uh, so what would be the way forward? The way forward will be described the best way by the way of the, by the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala advised Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And, uh, Inshallah, that's my next point. But the hadith states that if someone is bad to you, if your relative is bad to you, the Prophet said, you still do good. No matter what, you still do good. You have to keep on being good to those relatives who are even bad to you. And this can be highlighted in the story of Aisha radiallahu anha. When she was slandered, when the people of Medina uh, they slandered Aisha, Aisha radiallahu anha and this, they accused her of doing things that obviously she did not do and from the people that accused Aisha radiallahu anha was Mista now Mista was a cousin of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him good wealth a good amount of wealth he used to help Mista and his family by paying for their food and things like that so when this rumor started, Mr. was one of the people who joined in the rumor and he was telling people that Aisha radiallahu anha billah, did this shameful act. So it is Abu Bakr taking care of Mr. Yeah, so Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was taking care of the family of Mr. So he used to pay for his, he used to fund the family. Mm -hmm. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Yeah, and, and, and when, when the rumor came, Mr. helped in spreading the, the rumor. Regardless. Mr. Help, Mr. Help. Instead of helping Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and saying, no, no, Aisha radiallahu will never do this. He turned on Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and he started spreading the rumors in Medina. And at that moment, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he said, from today, I am never going to spend on Mr. Now, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when you think about it, Sheikh, can anyone in the right state of mind say that Abu Bakr is wrong for what he said? No. Okay. If someone accuses your daughter, and not just any daughter, you're talking about the daughter that married the Prophet a prophet, so, a, prophet, a prophet who happens to be your best friend. I mean, it is, it is big. Yes. Because once the Prophet was asked, who do you love the most from your wives? He said, Aisha Who do you love from, uh, and who do you love from the men? He said her, he said her father. As in Abu Bakr So they were best friends. His wife. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's best friend's wife. 
which happens to be his daughter as well. And Ummul Mu'mini, Aisha radiallahu anha. He is accusing this woman. And obviously, if Mista is related to Abu Bakr, he is obviously related to, related to Aisha radiallahu anha as well. So he's accusing his own relative. So at that moment, Abu Bakr radiallahu anha said, I will never ever spend upon Mista again. I don't care about what happens to his family. I'm never going to spend on him. And as a human being, we can say Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, up to a certain extent, is he's right to say what he said. Well, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Now remember, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he is the best of creation after the prophets. After the prophets, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is number one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals an ayah in the Quran telling Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu what? وَلَا يَأْتِرِي أُلِي الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ وَسَعَاتِ أَنْ يَكُوءً يُؤْتُ أَنْ يُؤْتُ أُلِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالْيَعْفُ وَالْيَصْفَحُ أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Surah An-Nur Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says And let not those of virtue So if you have money Abu Bakr, He's talking about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu Virtue The virtue of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu Was that he had much, a, lot of, a lot of money And wealth swear that they will not help their relatives and the needy and those who have traveled for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what does Allah say wal ya'fu wal yasfahu forgive and overlook we can say Allah he accused his daughter forgive and overlook Allah he Allah is saying forgive and overlook Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying I still want you to first. Saharan, uh, now that you're mentioning uh, this area and the tafsir, a lot of uh, thoughts are coming uh, onto my mind, right? Because th this was the prophet. We can just try to establish uh, the, the, the stature of, of these individuals. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether spiritual or social, whatever. This is the prophet. This is Aisha. This is Abu Bakr. Okay? And, and Allah tells Abu Bakr that forget and just just let go forgiven yeah. overlook like, like, like no language we say forgiven forget yeah i mean if this happened to the prophet some people amongst us they think someone should do a lot more to, to earn their forgiveness like <laughs> no one should ever wrong them now for those who do not understand the arabs arabs when it comes to uh, issues of slandering adultery fornication it is it is so strict so when, when they slander Aisha, <laughs> it is not something light. It's not something light. And it is, it is the prophet's what? The prophet's wife. The prophet's so wife. Even, even the Risala itself, the message of Allah is at, is at stake here. And yet, when Abu Bakr chose to become angry and stop feeding and supporting the other family of Mistah, who was a relative, Allah told, no, 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 you shouldn't do that. Actually, you should forgive and, and let go of that. Now, this is a lesson to all of us who are not in the position of, of Abu Bakr, Aisha, the Prophet. It shouldn't be very hard for us to forgive. We shall be talked about. We shall be uh, slandered. We shall be, I mean, a lot shall be done to us, but we are not so special to forgive. We, we can forgive anytime. And Allah is giving us the healthy way. Yes, you have been wronged, but the best thing to do is, I mean, here is set your heart free because Abu Bakr was being held captive at this moment. He was learning some new behavior that wasn't part of his normal way. So Abu Bakr had, Allah had to protect Abu Bakr's position in behavior, in faith, in everything. And the best way to do that was fa'afu. Uh, well, yes. Was, well, yeah, well, yes, fine. You, you forgive and let it go. Uh, so I thought we could stress that. And if you have anything to add on that, Sheikh. Yes, of course. And then in the very next, in the next part, the ayah, Allah says, Allah to hibbun and ya, and Allah lakum. Would you not prefer that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, would you not like that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you? So you want Allah to forgive you, but you're not forgiving other people. This is, just, it doesn't work like this. You forgive the other people, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have the mercy upon you and he will forgive you. Now, we have to understand that no matter what the problem is, no matter how big the issue is, no one, it can never be bigger than this. 
what mm-hmm. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu went through, it can never be bigger than this. Mm-hmm. Because we were talking about the wife of the Prophet sallam, also who happened to be his daughter. And Allah said, wal ya'fu wal yasbahu. Forgive and like you say, forget. So, um, like, so moving on to oh, moving on to another example, Sheikh Ashraf, and this is pretty my last example. I want to ask your audience a little quiz, if it's okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah? We, so, yeah. inshallah, I'm going to tell them a story, or part mm-hmm. of the story, about a prophet who was the son of a prophet, who was the son of a prophet, and who was the son of a prophet. So he's a prophet who is the son of a prophet who is the son of another prophet and he is also the son of a prophet. Mm-hmm. Who is this prophet I'm talking about? If you can mention the prophet I'm talking about or if you can mention all four prophets men- uh, I am indicating towards. Is there anyone all who right. can give us this answer? All right, the quiz is on. Anyone who knows the answer, if you could come again, please. So there is a prophet who is the son of a prophet who is a son of another prophet and who is a son of another prophet so there are four prophets here all right all right uh, we shall be waiting for the comments i believe they are now sc- scratching heads and <laughs> you can give me just the name of the main the, the prophet i'm talk i'm going to talk about or you can give me the names of all four prophets all right uh, okay someone is saying ibrahim Ibrahim al so we started off other way around. <laughs> we started <laughs> off with the, uh, the the main father. Someone is saying Ismail. Ismail, no, wrong answer. Okay, someone is saying uh, Yunus. Yunus, wrong answer. Okay, guys, you, you we, we've been teaching you a lot of things. You can't let me down right now. <laughs> 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 you know, it's yeah. okay. Uh, Prophet, so we have two answers which we can say is half correct. Someone is saying uh, uh, Prophet Yaqub. Yaqub al Islam. So, yeah, so we have two answers which are correct. Half correct, we should say. Half so, correct. the first so, the, the Prophet I was talking about is Yusuf alayhi salam, who was the mm-hmm. son of Yaqub alayhi salam, who was mm-hmm. the son of um, Ishaq alayhi salam, and who was the son of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So, and oh, Nabi, Ibn, someone has just mentioned this. <laughs> said <laughs> Yusuf. I think uh, the comment delayed to come, but if you can repeat that order for just for the purpose of uh, teaching our friend. Yeah. So his name was Yusuf alayhi salam, who was the son of Yaqub alayhi salam, who was also the son of um, Ishaq alayhi salam, and who was the son of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam has one of the best family lineages. Well, that was quite a family, Sheikh Zahran. I, I, I wish to uh, inspire our viewers and myself, of course. That how about you make you make yourself a sheikh, and then your your children will be like sheikhs, and their grandchildren will be sheikhs, sheikhs, sheikhs like that. I mean, you have <laughs> you could create that. Yes, that's inshallah. Ku ku and fusakum wa ahlikum nara. This comes back to the first ayah we mentioned. If you protect yourself and your family from the hellfire. Then your family and your family will protect their family, and their family will yeah. protect their family. So it's yeah. very important that the bond is kept. Obviously, none of us can be like Yusuf wasalam, But what we can do <coughs> is protect the ones that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given us responsibility over. So in the story of Yusuf wasalam, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and inshallah, I will finish with this. I don't want to take too much time. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, He says in the surah of, in surah Yusuf that the, in the story of Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, there are many lessons that an individual can take from this story and one of the lessons we understand is that when we look into his story Yusuf alayhi salam was thrown away into the well his brothers intended to kill him but instead they threw him into a well and then he gets taken far away why did the brothers do this because of jealousy no other reason Yusuf alayhi salam's father loved him a little bit more than he loved his own brothers. So they got jealous, they got angry, and they took it out in the way that they wanted to get rid of Yusuf alayhi salam. Many years later, Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam, after going through so many problems in his life, he has now become the minister of Egypt. 
And when his brothers come because they have a shortage of food, Yusuf Islam recognizes them. But obviously they do not recognize Yusuf Islam. So they go into a conversation with each other. But Yusuf Islam doesn't tell them who he is. And when eventually they figure out that this is Yusuf Islam, what does Yusuf Islam say to them? Now those who know the story of Yusuf Islam, they know what the troubles he went through. But what does Yusuf Islam say to them at the end? Since today there is no blame on you today. Allah will forgive you and He is the most merciful. He is the, he is the most merciful of the people of mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. So Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, after everything his brothers put him through, after everything that happened to Yaqub alayhi salam because of what the brothers did, Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, he forgives his family. Coming back to the topic, family matters. So inshallah, based on what I've said, I'd like to summarize into four points. Um, uh, number one, we fix ties with those who have broken the ties with us. Number two, okay. we give to those who don't give to us. We do not. If someone does not give you something, it doesn't mean you stay with them. No, you give. You forgive those who have oppressed you. And number four, you, you are good to those who are bad to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sheikh Zahran. That was uh, quite, uh, you've, you've, you've shared with us quite an experience, you know. Sometimes these, these, these uh, live broadcasts start out as classes, as webinars, but in the end, they become experience. So you have just given us something great, a great of an experience, Jazakallah Khairan. Uh, we've had uh, people really get so much. Uh, today they are very active. Uh, I'm sure they're, uh, Zulaikha is saying, me, I know the story. It makes me cry whenever I listen to it. Yeah. You know, the story of Yusuf is known. Allah Ta'ala testify that Ahsan uh, al-Qasas, it is the best story. So those who do not know this story of uh, Prophet Yusuf uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to invite you to study about it, learn about it. There are a lot of, uh, actually, uh, when you go deeper, it is it is everything. It is spiritual, economic, <laughs> everything. Like uh, romantic as well. <laughs> romantic as well. Ah, you know that. <laughs> I, I think we should get it there and we, we just to come and share uh, about the story of. Uh, uh, Inshallah, one day. That <laughs> Inshallah. It is, it is pretty romantic, actually. Very romantic in in, in ways you can never imagine. Uh, I had a question. Uh, there, there are many questions that have come here, but there was a comment where a sister was saying it is so hard. Like there is nothing as hard as maintaining or creating a good relationship with uh, uh, a family member. I think we could start. I mean, end this session by giving some advice. How do we tackle this? I know you have mentioned these wonderful uh, comments at, I mean, at at the end. But how would you respond to this comment? Sorry, what's the question again? You, she, you cut she, off. She was like, there is nothing as hard as maintaining relationship with the, with the family member. Okay, when it comes to maintaining with the family, now you have to understand one thing, Sheikh. Is that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we do not go every single, we do not have to ring them every single day or go to their house every single day. That's not what is asked from, for, from us. What is asked from us is that when we see them, or when they come over, or when we go to their place, we are good with them. This is all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet ﷺ is asking for us. That we are good. We don't have to always constantly ring them, or constantly go to their house. This is not what the Prophet ﷺ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking from us. He's saying, be good to your relatives. And being good can be anything. You know, just salam alaykum. If you see them on the streets, assalamu alaykum. Sometimes, maybe you you see them, but they don't see you. So you walk up to them and say, assalamu alaykum. You know, the main thing is assalam. And we do not realize the power of Assalamu Alaikum. We don't realize the strength of Assalamu Alaikum. We think, you know, it's something we say every single day. But 
when we say assalamu alaikum to someone when we say good morning to someone we do not know how bad the how bad the morning a person is having you know he you might say good morning to someone but his wife kicked him out the house do you know what i'm trying to say or you might say good morning to someone and he had a problem with his children or he had a problem with his parents so we don't know if he's having a good morning or a terrible morning but when we say assalamu alaikum to someone we are saying peace be upon you so whatever problems you are going through, may Allah put peace in your life. And this is something we need to understand that Assalamu Alaikum is a very, very important aspect of our life. So the, like the, the sister's question was, how do I maintain? It's not, you don't have to ring them. The main thing is you, you are good with them. When you see them, when you speak to them, you are good with them. When they call you over to their house, you, in, you accept the invitation. Um, because it's one of the rights of the Muslim that you accept the invitation. Of a Muslim. Mm-hmm. So this hopefully inshallah answers the question of the sister. Uh, well, well, uh, this was, uh, that was Sister Sharifa. Uh, thank you for Sheikh Sahara. Uh, Come back again, I guess I will not invite you. You, were, you already <laughs> invited. <laughs> and uh, there is uh, uh, Brother Bolts. He's, uh, I've learned a lot. We are at uh, bad terms with my own paternal brothers. So he has a challenge with the brothers. Allah make like easy. You, you send him, make for him dua. Inshallah. One thing I would like to tell your viewers, if ever Sheikh Ashraf calls me, I will never say no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I won't let you say that, I mean, speak out our story. <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> you, you, you want to, to tell them our secrets? <laughs> Well, I'm no. glad to host you, brother um, uh, Zahra. Uh, people are thanking you. Hajit Mariam is saying, um, uh, thank you for this wonderful topic. I'm looking for some quick. Uh, you're welcome, Sister Mariam. Uh, let us see. Have you seen any? Uh, she was asking how romantic. Well, this is a story for another day. The story of uh, Yusuf is is the best story, as Allah said in the Quran. Excellent. Allah said He's going to tell you the best story. So Allah is telling the story, the best story. You can imagine the source, and uh, so yes. we, we shall learn about that. Inshallah. Let me say Yusuf uh, and Moses with Haron make me okay. Have you seen any questions? Maybe uh, there's regarding... one from Medina Bashir. Sheikh, uh-huh. if you prefer, you'd like to do something. And they don't appreciate your part. They keep saying. I think it's one, two, three. Fifth comment from the bottom. Okay. From Medina, right? Yes. Uh, if you if you if you pro, let, me, let me put it on the screen. Uh, if you provide your relatives with something and they do not appreciate your part, they keep saying you have a lot, but you give them less. Then you give it to other people who are not your relatives, and they appreciate you and pray for you. Um, who give- you should support both because the Prophet said in the Hadith. Uh, once a man complained to him about his relatives being bad, same situation, and the person said, Keep giving to them. So you have to keep giving to them. Whether they appreciate or not, that's between them and Allah. But your relationship with Allah is different. If Allah has given you the means to provide for your relatives and for other people, then you have to do your part. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask you about your charity. He will not, however, ask you um, if people appreciated it or not. Mm-hmm. Great, and maybe from the fiqh perspective, I would say they shouldn't stop giving the relatives unless the relatives yeah. do not really want it at all. Mm-hmm. But if they are just complaining, there is a, there is something good about uh, giving to the relatives because it is swila or sadaqa, sadaqa or swila. So you're giving out charity, but again you're trying to uh, strengthen the family bonds, and we're talking about family bonds here. So you you are rewarded twice. No? Unless they, they become, I don't know, rebellious or something, they throw the food to you. <laughs> Sometimes some people get to that extent, but I think you should maintain both as, uh, and, and maybe something to, 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 
bring out here. Shaitan should not convince you that the praises of the other people who are not family are, are better than maintaining a family yes. bond. You know, Shaitan is very, very wise. Shaitan is very, yeah. The old ones will make you feel bad. The family will make you feel bad. But again, these ones who are very far, they will praise you and you'll, you, you know, that, that, that serotonin rush. Okay. <laughs> you feel recognized. You feel... Uh, and, 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 and here shaitan comes to convince you some way, somehow that these ones are better than these ones and you, you drop this bond. No, you keep doing the good to the both of uh, your family members and the, 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 the other people out there. Yes, yeah. Um, let me see, let him call you more and more. You have to shake some people. <laughs> okay. I think Zuleika asked a very good question. If you see uh, Zuleika oh, bit Isa, you provide anything for your relatives. If you can put that question up, inshallah, I'd like to answer oh, that. Okay, let's see. Zuleika is saying. Okay. You provide anything. So you provide for your relatives who do not work. What do you do? Okay, this is a very important question because in the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, there was a person, I want to quickly say a story, there was a person who was, well, Umar radiallahu anhu saw in the masjid at Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Anisha. So he was in the masjid the full day. So Umar radiallahu anhu was a very, he was a person of a lot of questions. He was always observing what's going on. So he approaches this person, he says to him, you know, I saw you in the masjid at Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and all the way up to Isha. Do you not have a family to go back to? Do you not provide for your family? So this person, what he said, he said, me, I'm trying to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brother, he earns for me and my family. You know what Umar radiallahu anhu did to this individual? He didn't pat him on the back and say, mashallah, you're doing a very good job. No, he got his stick and he chased him outside the masjid. <laughs> and he said, go get a job. Go earn some money because right now your brother is better than you. So earning for yourself and for your family is in fact an ibadah. It's a word, it's a it's an act of ibadah. Not keeping the mosque for the whole day, not working. No, this is not this is not ibadah. This is a uh, hulu, you you think you are doing something good. In reality, you're not doing anything. So um you getting a job and providing for your family is also an act of ibadah. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I think that is very important to understand about Islam. Everything that you do, if you put in the right near, becomes a bad. So, taking care of your family is more of a bad than you staying in the mosque and spending all all, all your days in the mosque. And yeah. this is why, and the, the the companions understood this very well. This is why Omar, Rabbi Allah, and who did that. Otherwise, he wouldn't have done that. But from yeah. the fiqh of the Prophet, the way he nurtured them, they understood that you have to get out of the mosque and go fend for your what. For your for your family. Uh, have you seen any other comments? Let me see. Uh, Bols is like check. Let me pull this and see. It's like a question. Um, what if your father feels jealous about the provisions you give to your own kids? Then in this situation, you just make the eye for your father and try to explain to him nicely because obviously, from the from this, I can understand that there is a a family issue here which has to be addressed by i'm um, my advice will be you have to go to the local imam and speak to your local imam so he knows the both sides of the story as to why your father may feel this way or why you think your father feels this way so it's very important that you um speak to your local imam or speak to your local mashaykh and try to solve this matter is this i cannot answer this question um by hearing one side of the story, if you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, I understand that. But, but it was good advice. Let us uh, visit the local imam and things will be sorted out. Now, there's a question from Sister Nashra. She's saying, so um, all in all, no way we are, there is no way we are allowed to keep distance uh, away from uh, the family. And so she's like, oh, me, there has to be a way to keep, uh, <laughs> there has to be a reason. I don't know if you're looking, yes, if you're looking if you're looking for a reason, you will get it. But um, I, I would comment before Sheikh Zaharan uh, uh, says, some, says something about this. Uh, Sister Nashra, unless if they threaten your life, 
So you yeah. cannot stay in a house or if, if they pose a threat to your life, your children, or if staying closer actually spices up the whole, uh, I mean, toxic, I mean, so sometimes keeping close becomes the real problem. And it's, it's nice actually to stay away. And we see that in the prophet's life when um, the, the, this gentleman, the Sahabi who killed uh, Hamza, the prophet forgave him and asked, asked him to uh, stay, stay away. I mean, sometimes uh, it is good to stay away, not to, in, in order to, 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 to not let the fire uh, yeah. catch them. Yeah. Okay. I, I believe there are no any more questions, Sheikh Zahran. It has been a nice experience. If you may have a few uh, words before you close, please. Uh, my advice to everyone listening is that Ramadan is now coming to an end. And um, we do not know if we will make it to the next Ramadan. And I'm pretty sure um, that many of us have lost loved ones during this year from last Ramadan to this Ramadan, um, especially with the virus. So I will ask and advise everyone to do the best you can to come more close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These lectures that you hear um, from Sheikh Ashraf, from other people who come on this platform, it's a reminder not just for you, but for ourselves as well. And um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the understanding of the deen correctly. Um, this deen is not based upon our desires. We do not do what we like. It's a very sad reality that in the month of Ramadan, people reach the highest levels of Iman. And uh, after Ramadan, you know, subhanallah, not after each day, the same levels they drop. This is not what Islam is. Islam is our iman should stay steady throughout the entire year. More importantly, throughout our entire lives, because we do not know when death is going to come to us. And in the lecture I uh, described, may Allah protect us and save us. But I described the angels who are standing at the gates of hell, and these are just the angels who are standing at the gates of hell. Imagine what hellfire itself is like. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, inshallah. I mean, I mean, uh, well, thanks for accepting our invitation. I'm hoping, inshallah, to have you again soon, Sheikh Zahran. And inshallah. thanks to the beloved viewers. We really appreciate your time. And uh, we uh, ask Allah to reward you the best for this time you're giving in or putting in to, to, to follow an Islamic lecture like this one. Jazakumullah <laughs> khairan. Uh, see you inshallah next time. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah.